So again, welcome to everyone. Before we dive into today's presentation, I'd just like to make sure everyone who is joining us is familiar with 20 over 10 since I did notice that there are quite a few people who are not um, current clients with us. So 20 over 10 creates tailored mobile responsive websites for financial advisors and others in compliance regulated industries. You can visit our website to learn more, but I did wanna bring that up because many of the SEO factors that we are discussing today are things that we as a web development company will take care of for the advisors we work with. But you're also gonna see that many of the factors are completely dependent on you as the business owner. So for these areas, it's really gonna be up to you to take the action and keep everything up to date. Regardless, all of these things are factors you should keep in mind, whether you are redesigning a website, building one from scratch, or just thinking about how you can keep your content best optimized for SEO. So a little bit about me. Again, my name is Samantha Russell. I am the Director of Sales and Marketing here at 20 Over 10, and I was part of the founding team. I have helped 20 over 10 develop our own SEO strategy since we launched. And I will say it has not been easy, especially being a new player in the FinTech market and not having the words advisor or website in our company name, URL, domain. Um, it's taken a while for us to build up organic links and rank higher in the search results. We use a couple of different tools to monitor our own SEO progress on various keywords that are important for our business. And we've been really happy to see our website and blog ranking on the first page of Google for many of these search terms, especially within the last six months. So I'm excited to share what I've learned and convey that insight to you today. I've also helped hundreds of advisors write content for their own websites, as well as define their social media presence and strategy. So if you wanna learn more about me, I put a link to a blog post that's really not at all about what I do, but much more about me and uh, just hobbies and interests that are interesting to me. So you can read that if you are so inclined. So six um, points to keep in mind as we go through today's presentation. The first one is this webinar is focused on organic search. So if you're looking for information on paid per click or ads, we will not cover that today. The second is that SEO is constantly evolving. Right. So what is important today may be drastically different in a few years. And we see that all the time. Google updates their algorithms. And what was important for SEO a few years ago is often not the case today. Google's goal is to give its own users the best search results. And so really what you want to think about is you want to have great content that causes people to first click on your site and then stay a while because the content is useful to them. And then hopefully to even keep coming back more because the content continues to be useful. That is really the best way to improve your ranking. And if you think about it, that's also best for the user experience, right? So what's good is for SEO is good for user experience is good for SEO. It's really a cycle. And I keep mentioning Google because Google is king. Uh, search engines are more complex than ever, but Google is still the number one. And what they do is really the um, gold standard for how SEO experts come up with their strategy. I also want to point out that Google search results are personalized down to the device and zip code. So if somebody is searching for the term financial advisor and they are physically located in Cleveland, Ohio, they're going to get a completely different set of results than someone who conducts the same search in Phoenix. A lot of us understand this and know that now inherently. Um, the financial services industry, however, is also very different from other industries. And we all know that we cannot have reviews of our product and service on review sites the way that other industries do. So, you know, we can't prevent anybody from writing a review about us, but we're not going to go and actively search out those reviews. And Google's algorithm, their latest one, really takes into account for local search especially reviews for local businesses and services. So this industry is going to have a different approach because we can't necessarily always include um, those factors. And the last point is that ranking high on Google might get you more traffic, but it's not going to convert your leads for you. So a good SEO score doesn't 
correlate directly with effective marketing. Rather than entirely focus on maximizing your SEO, you should create a website with the SEO and your site visitors in mind. Eventually, if your site is designed the right way and you produce content, people will come back for more and eventually be converted. I just have um, an image here of a site that um, we designed for Wealthkeel. And this is um, a mobile snapshot. But if you were to keep scrolling, you have a video of Chad, the advisor. And then there's a, we'll trade you nine financial tips for your email address. And he has a little box there where people can add in their information and get um, an email newsletter from him. And he does a great um, conversion rate with that. So what we really want to talk about today are two things, right? On-page SEO versus off-page SEO. So your search engine optimization strategy should include both because both are crucial to the success of your site. But they're really two different sides of, of the coin here when it comes to improving your rankings. Your actual website is like the part of an iceberg that is above water, the part that everyone can see. The components that make up this part, these on-the-page factors, would be the content on your page, the page structure, the coding, the HTML, the meta descriptions, all of those things that physically make up your website, those are considered to be on the page factors. But just like an iceberg, the part that we actually see actually makes up a much smaller percentage than what's underneath. So the off the page factors would be the part of the iceberg underwater. And that would include things like the number and quality of links, the age of your domain, how much history that domain name has. Uh, social media presence, site performance. These are all things that, well, some of them we have control over. Sometimes we don't, right? We can't necessarily all of a sudden um, make our domain, the age of our domain, a lot older if we're a new business and we just registered it for the first time. So some things we can control, some we can't, but they all contribute to our overall ranking. So a good way to think about this is, what you rank for is largely determined by those on the page factors. And then how high you rank on a SERP, which stands for a search engine results page, um, which is just fancy to say how high you rank on Google, is largely determined by the off the page factors. So that really makes sense if you think about it. Um, you know, the content on your website is going to explain who you are, what you do. That's where those keywords are going to be. And then everything else is going to be behind the scenes. Um, with the other signals sending to Google. And Google has actually said that there are hundreds of factors, what they call signals, that go into rankings. So we're gonna cover the most important ones today. So if you think about what you rank for, again, we're talking about what are the keywords or phrases somebody would type into the search engine that would then lead them to find you on the page. Um, another thing to think about is we can see, you know, there's also the little Google voice here. People search differently now than they ever have before because we've gotten used to Google being so good at deciphering what we mean by different search results. So search engine optimization experts are also now trying to figure out what's the best way to come up with a strategy for things like voice search, where the way we speak you know, might dictate and change um, what we search for. And as you can see from the example above, um, as I just alluded to, because Google's gotten so good at this, it actually understands sometimes what we're asking for without us even having to say it. So if I search weather, I'm located physically here in State College, Pennsylvania, Google understands that I am searching for the weather because I probably want to know what it's like outside, not because I want to know the definition of the word weather or um, the history of, you know, the study of weather. So that's really, really interesting because there's so many words that we don't have to include that can still give us the results we want. And for certain companies, this is really going to impact their SEO strategy. This section right here that we're looking at that has that weather information, Google rolled out a few years ago. You may um, know that it's called the knowledge graph. And they do it for recipes, for weather, for restaurant reviews, for local searches, for places of business. We're going to see that come up over and over again in today's presentation because so many advisors are running local businesses um, where their demographics are based in their certain geographic area. 
So I'm even, you know, I'm sure that sites like AccuWeather or Weather.com have really seen a decrease in their overall organic um, site traffic just from searches because the information is displayed right in the SERP without somebody needing to click on any page. So that was all the on the page, the what we rank for. And then when we think about how high we rank, we're just meaning where do you fall in the organic search results. So the reason I just wanted to point this out is on this example here, we can see there's actually three ads that come first. Then again, there's that knowledge graph. The knowledge graph does contain some local search results. Uh, shout out to Van Wee Financial, who's a client of 20 over 10, getting a good ranking there. But we still haven't even seen the actual listing of organic results on this page, and we're already below the fold. So the way that Google has set up these pages is really changing um, with this new algorithm how sites are displaying on those SERPs. Okay, so let's really dive deep into those on the page versus the off the page factors. I love this table because it's a really great visual. We're in the business of visuals here at 20 over 10 um, to help you understand all of the various components that go into search engine optimization. So um, if, you, if you can, I'd love in the comments or the, the chat box if anybody's seen this before to let me know. Um, I'm always interested to see how many people have seen this or taken time to understand it. But it was put out by Search Engine Land back in 2011, and they update it every single year with um, new information depending on the algorithm and how it's changed by Google and what is new just in the world of, of search. So it's divided into um, you know, the middle and then the two sidebars. The middle section is the part that looks like the periodic table of elements, obviously right here. And then further, we can see the on-the-page SEO here on the blue side, and then the off-the-page SEO on the green side. Both of those sections, so off on the page is explained here on the left, and then um, off the page here on the right. So if we zoom in to examine the on-the-page and off-the-page uh, periodic table part, we can see that they're further divided into different columns, right? So we have on the on the page, we have content, your site architecture, your HTML or your coding on the back end. And then on the off the page, we have things like trust, um, the number of links and the types of links, personal information such as where the searcher is physically located, what country are they in, where are they geographically based. Um, one of the things I like to point out here too, if you can see under country and locality, those um, both get plus three. So each of these um, elements either get a plus or a minus sign that's weighted depending on how much search engine land thinks it contributes to the overall ranking. So if somebody is trying to run a virtual practice, for instance, like 20 over 10, right, we're not just taking clients in any one city, we're targeting people throughout the country. It's going to make it a lot harder for us to not be tied to one um, geographic location in the beginning to rank and compete against those who are. So for any advisor who's running a virtual practice, um, we'll talk as we go on further some of the things that you can do, but just know from the outset, it's going to take a, bit, a little bit longer to get those higher rankings because you're competing against Google's love of localized search. So the factors in red are all items that can actually hurt your SEO. So we know things like spam, um, paid links, paying people to have uh, links back to your website. Um, stuffing of keywords in your HTML or hiding keywords in your HTML, having content that's way too thin that doesn't really explain your site or what you do. These are all things that can negatively hurt your SEO. So those are obviously very important to pay attention to, too. Um, I'm also going to send out a um, couple of links post-webinar. I didn't include them here today. I'm going to email them to everyone, and they will give you some great checks that you can run to see what your site is getting in terms of scoring. So if you are, um, you'll put your URL in for your site, and then it will actually give you a score based upon, you know, the, all of these different factors, what you're getting right, what you're not getting right, and where you can improve. So that will be really helpful to all of you as well. So we're going to take time and go through each of the sections and really focus on the um, areas that you can actually have some, you know, you can actually do something about basically. Um, 
and steps that you can actually take that are going to increase your ranking, you know, as you take them, which is very important for everyone. You want to be able to control where your site is going to be listed. So this isn't a comprehensive list by any means, just a good starting point. And I've also um, linked to all of the different sources throughout the site so you can look up more information there. So if we start with the on the page and we talk about a content checklist, some of these things are things you've probably all heard of before. Some of them you may not. Um, content is one usually everyone knows. You want it to be original, fresh, and high quality. For headers, we want to make sure that the headers and subheaders are relevant to our text. So I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between these two as I explain them. So if we look at this site here, um, we have great content on the page. This is a blog post that 20 over 10 wrote about Riskalyze, a review of Riskalyze, and um, how advisors can use it on their websites. So we wrote this post over eight months ago, and yet it still continues to get really high quality traffic every day. And that's obviously because advisors are interested in Riskalyze. They want to use it. They want to know, is it worth the investment? You know, how should I use it on my website to capture leads? So we wrote a post about it. It was a great, you know, fit for us and a great piece of quality content for our users. So it continues to help um, drive traffic to our site. So when we, the content overall is great. When we talk about headers, this how to use Riskalyze on your website is one of those headers. So if we go back here, we're seeing that it's telling us we need to have headlines and subheadlines that have relevant keywords we'd want to rank for and that are going to make sense for that piece. So the words are Riskalyze and website, two things that we would be keywords for this piece. So that's really important. But also note that that header also breaks up the copy, right? This is just one piece snippet of a larger blog post. But if you were scanning through and you didn't really care maybe how Riskalyze was priced, you didn't care about what it was, you wanted to learn how to use it on your website, you could just scan the page, see that header, and then read this part of the blog post. So from a user experience, it's also really important to have those headers. We see that the URL is short and sweet. It's actually kind of cut off here, but it's just why we love Riskalyze. Um, in most cases, you'll want your URL of any page or blog post that you do to match the title of that page. So if the title of your page was how to use Riskalyze on your website, typically you wouldn't want it to say why we love Ris with Riskalyze. Excuse me. It, it should match. Um, at 20 over 10, we automatically generate those URLs for you, so you don't have to worry about that. We'll make sure that those two match, but if you're working with a provider where you have to automatically generate those, you'll want to make sure that your URL doesn't contain any weird numbers or letters or have too many subfolders, um, that it's short and sweet. So the internal links within the page... When you have a blog post or a page on your site, it's a great opportunity for you to link back to other relevant content. So we all know links are important, and not just inbound links from other sites coming to your page, but also links within your page to other pages on your site. So we can see here that we've done that. Um, we'll come back to the meta description because we can't see it in this example. But then for images, one thing I want to point out that I see a lot of advisors don't do is add Number one, an alt text, which is considered to be a way to communicate with the search engine about that image. So because the search engine can't read everything that's in this image and it doesn't understand that the reason I have this image here is to show how Riskalyze can be embedded, I need to tell it that. So there's two things I can do. Number one, when I upload the file into my website, I should call the file, give it a name that describes what it is in relation to the article. So instead of just saying screenshot of asset solutions, which says nothing about this article and what we're doing, I should name you know, that file something like example of a website using Riskalyze. That's going to give much more information to the search engine about what I'm trying to tell it and how it relates to the page. And if you're ever embedding a video, one of the things you really want to keep in mind is Videos are often longer and have even way more information. So in those cases, you really want to make sure, as we can see here, we have a little caption, that you take the time to write a caption for your video that includes the keywords and optimally a summary of what that video is about so that the search engine can scan it. So the page titles and the meta descriptions are what actually make up the search results. 
And I just want to go over these things because I still hear from a lot of people that don't understand some of these basic SEO principles. So the title tag here would be Bay Point Wealth Management Home. That would be the title tag of their overall website. And then your team, contact, why Bay Point? These are all title tags of their sub pages. They have a robust blog. Each of their blog posts would also have its own title tag. The meta description is the gray part underneath that describes what the site is about. And so a lot of discussion happens about meta description and meta keywords. Google does not use meta keywords at all in ranking, so you don't need to even bother filling those out in your site. But the meta description is very useful because it is displayed to the user, right? So for somebody scanning a quick you know, list of search results after they did a query, they may use that meta description to decide whether or not to click on your link. So you want your meta description to convey really great information. It's basically an ad for your website. If you don't write a meta description that is good copy and that actually matches some of the content on your page, Google will not use that meta description and instead it will assign one of its own from the content on your page. If that has happened to you, um, you want to immediately go back and start playing around with your meta description and see how you can improve it. You don't want to, you know, just let Google assign it, but that's telling you that whatever you put in your meta description is not matching the content on your page. So if you are um, working with 20 over 10, just thought I'd put this in here. There are two places that you can update meta descriptions in your site. Um, the first would be site-wide meta descriptions for your entire website. You go to the content editor, account, and then settings SEO. And then if you are trying to do it page by page or subpage, you would go into the content editor and then click on one of the subpages you wanted to edit and then click page settings and then click your um, meta description there. So when we talk about content, and of course we want the content to have the information that we want to rank for on the page, how should we write that content then, right? I'm not going to go too much into detail about actually writing content. Um, I have a whole other webinar that I gave recently on six steps to writing great website content that includes a lot of these SEO factors. If you haven't checked it out yet, it's on our Vimeo channel, so you can find it there, and it'll take you step-by-step step through those steps writing from scratch. But the basics are, and this should be a no-brainer, but I see so many financial advisors who do not do this. You should have who you are, what you do, who you do it for, and where you are located on your website, optimally on multiple pages of your website. You should also have a blog and post regularly. And then the third one, um, there's so many people who come to us and say, well, I don't need a blog because I just use third-party articles that are posted to my site. Third-party articles are great. They can give you credibility. They can show um, they're keeping your site fresh when you don't have time to always blog. But using those is not an SEO strategy. They are not going to be tailored to your specific business unless you have a ghostwriter. Um, they're going to be on multiple other advisors' sites. So there is a place for that, those third-party you know, canned content, as we call it, but it's not an SEO strategy. So I really want you to keep that in mind. If you want to rank higher for different keywords, you need to blog regularly. I would also um, just want to point out that for advisors that are not, remember we talked about if you, what if you're a virtual practice and you're not in a um, set location, the blog is where you can really start to rank higher for different keywords that you want to be associated with. So for you, it's going to become probably one of the most important strategies of your digital marketing and SEO. So this is just a quick example. It doesn't need to be complicated when we talk about who you are and what you do. Here we see an example of a company called Pro Wealth. Um, Kelly Jennings is um, a former NFL player that is now a financial advisor, and he launched this practice, Pro um, Wealth Management. And so his URL has the words Pro Wealth and Invest in it. Um, his you know page title has Pro Wealth Management here at the top. If you're able to see the whole thing, and then here on his actual H1s and H2s, we have financial planning for professional athletes. So it's, you know, very descriptive, explaining exactly what it is he does, who he does it for. And if you were to scroll through the site, he has many more references to where he is actually located. They also have a link here. This is a sub page of a larger firm he's part of called Branding Wealth Management. So what they did that was so smart was rather than just try to write blogs all the time about 
how they work with professional athletes, they created a website for this niche that they're trying to target. So now this whole website is devoted with all of the keywords, phrases, its own blog posts related to this target demographic. And then they can also link back to their other website. Um, so they're having those linking domains as well, which is always, always good. So the second on the page um, factor beyond content, if we remember, if we recall from that periodic table of elements, the first column was content and the second was architecture. I'm going to combine the architecture and the HTML things in this discussion together because these are both things that are often things that your um, developer needs to handle for you. So can the search engine easily crawl your site? Is your site mobile responsive? Does your site load quickly? How is the site coded? Those are all things that you often, if you're not building your own site, are not going to have a ton of control over. But I want to point it out because you want to make sure you find someone who can do those things for you and ensure that your site will meet those requirements. So in terms of structuring your content, um, there's some things I just want to point out that are very easy, but I, again, see a lot of people not doing. So this is a screenshot from the homepage of an advisor in Cincinnati, and he's a fee-only planner based in Cincinnati, Ohio, targeting the Cincinnati area. And so we can see um, from his headers here that he's got the headers that he's using not only to keep a nice flow of information, but also to alert Google to the keywords or phrases that he wants to rank for. So fee-only financial planning in Cincinnati, Ohio. Improve your life by organizing your finances. Comprehensive, holistic financial planning, the best value. These are all communicating something to Google, but it's also making it easier for the visitor when we land on this page to scan these sections. So if we just saw one big block of paragraph text, it would be way less enticing to read more. So again, those headers are really important. And if I can suggest an exercise, it would be go back and look at your own websites. And anytime you can find big blocks of paragraph text, start breaking them out and including headers that both summarize the paragraph below it, but then also include keywords related to your page. You also want to write your page and blog titles so that they can contain keywords, are search engine friendly, and are shareable. Right? So we're thinking more beyond just how the content looks on the page, but paying attention to the idea that every single blog post that you write or page you create becomes its own subpage of, it, of the website with its own keyword-rich title tag. For most content management systems, whatever you title your blog post is also going to become the page title of that post, as well as the URL that is used for that page. And since we know that Google uses page titles to help decide which results to show, we want our blog titles to reflect the types of searches we would hope our site would be found for. And then furthermore, we want our posts to be intriguing to users, circulated on social media. So we want to post the title. We want to create a post with a title that will entice people to click on it. So it, for example, the first blog post we have listed here is how much do I really need to retire? That's a great title, right? It describes the post. It has a phrase that may be searched for often and, you know, we'll get a lot of searches just overall. However, on the flip side of things, there are also probably many, many posts that are titled the same thing. So I did a little research and I searched this phrase, how much do I really need to retire? And there were over eight results on the first page that were all from major news organizations such as Kiplinger's, Forbes, Time Magazine, et cetera, right? Which we would expect. I think there was like, there was uh, probably like 300 million results overall. So the average advisor with a small practice and a brand new domain name is not necessarily going to be able to compete with those outfits. Outlets. So what would I suggest to someone I was working with? I would suggest that they get even more specific in a situation like this. So for instance, um, this advisor happens to be based in Chicago. So I might say he should title his post Chicagoans with a, a semicolon. How much do you think you need to retire? And then maybe add more information specific to the city of Chicago and you know the cost of living there. It may not even get him that many more organic searches, but if he were to go and then share that post on social media with his network and he's physically based in Chicago, a lot more people are going to click on it and potentially share it and those will all become links back to his site. 
Okay, so I hope all those on the page factors made sense. And now we're going to talk about off the page SEO because as we saw from that iceberg example, this is going to make up a lot more of what you need to focus on. So the off the page factors that we're going to go through are domain history, links, hyperlink text, and local search. So this is a little graphic that I um, think helps people understand the way that links work because there's been so much miscommunication about links um, over time. If you have a bathtub with rubber duckies in it, so the ducks are your pages, and you start filling the tub up with water, which is the links, your ducks are all going to rise to the top. So think of the water as the links, the, the duckies as the pages, and the, the actual bathtub is your website. So what this is saying is that quantity of links really is important, right? We want to have a good number of links coming back to our website. As we're going to see um, as time goes on, though, it's not actually just the quantity. It is also the quality. And um, this analogy, while it's a great visual and it's something to pay attention to, if we could almost make visuals for the, the, the water quality in this one, um, maybe I should edit that image in the future, that would actually be important. So how you know good of quality the links are is also going to make a difference. But just keep in mind that overall, the links are one of the most important factors. So whenever I talk about that analogy, one of the questions I get asked is, okay, so should I participate in one of those link exchanges that I see all these other advisors having on their site where, you know, I'm friends with 100 advisors, but we all work in different states. So I'll list my website on all of their websites and they'll list it on mine. Should I do this? They will ask me. Um, and in short, the answer is no. So yes, it is true that in the past, a website with the largest number of backlinks would rank higher. Google, Google's algorithm is now completely changed. So link quality is going to be so important. And Google has ways of understanding whether or not the links on your site are trying to just rank you higher in the search engine or actually are great quality links. I'm going to just go through later and explain how they, they know this so that you can also tell yourself. Um, but just know that those link exchanges are really not going to uh, benefit you. If they do in the short run, it's just a matter of time before the search engine realizes what you're doing and then it won't help you anymore. And oftentimes people update their sites, they change the domain names, they add subpages, and then your links become broken, which is even worse. So I really advise our clients to not waste their time um, with this one. So if you need to build more links and you don't want to do link exchanges, how can you build links organically? Um, these are just some of the examples you can use, but number one, we've already talked about, create awesome content that people want to link to because it's valuable or interesting or funny or just something good to read. Um, this example I have here is a blog that um, our friend Dave Grant, who's a financial advisor, he started Nat for Genesis, and he's also um, writes for Financial Planning Magazine and runs a finance comp or I'm sorry, a financial planning company as well. He did a guest post for us on comparing um, the idea of creating a Tinder for financial advisors so that people could find an advisor near them as easily as people find someone to date on Tinder. Sort of a tongue-in-cheek post, but it was funny, it's interesting, um, things that somebody might want to read and then share on social media. So creating content like this that can get some buzz, it doesn't always have to be um, serving some lofty purpose, it can just be something that you can share on social media and will get links back to your, your page. And if you're thinking, well, I'm in a really highly regulated industry, I can't do stuff that's, you know, as um, informal or, you know, tongue in cheek, it doesn't need to be anything, uh, you know, super, super um, out of the box, but just get a little creative. Maybe you write a post about yourself uh, behind the scenes of, you know, meet our staff members and you profile different members of your team. You could do something on the local community. So 10 events in Phoenix you don't want to miss this year. And one of them you happen to mention, it's something that a local nonprofit that you volunteer is with. So, you know, it does connect back to you, you or your company. You can really get more creative. Um, but the idea is what is something that people would actually want to read beyond just, you know, commentary on the markets and what would they share? Trying to cast that wider net of your audience. Those social media shares are all, you know, going to really help. Another thing you can do 
is send emails to influencers or others in the industry and those have those emails ultimately link back to you. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the more that you can guest blog post or, you know, have your content be picked up and posted other places, especially for highly reputable domains that have good authority, um, that is really going to boost your SEO. So remember I talked about how Google can understand whether or not a link is a good quality link and it can figure it out. We're going to go through three ways that they can do this. So the first two are uh, topical relevance and backlink location. So the topical relevance one is um, the biggest factor, in my opinion. Basically what it means is, does the context of this link and where it is on the page uh, make sense? You want to ensure that the placement of your link makes sense both to the user and to the search engine. So it should really relate um, to what you're already writing about and naturally flow. So here in this example, we see we're talking about Facebook Live being the future of marketing for financial advisors. And in one of the sentences, we say, first, follow Facebook's expert tips for shooting Facebook Live. That is then hyperlinked back to um, the Facebook Live expert tip page. It flows naturally. It makes sense. So the um, search engines, such as Google, will understand that it's a good fit and a good high-quality link. The second one is just the backlink location, right? So we were talking about, you know, whether you should be part of a link exchange where there's all these links on the sidebar. Links on sidebars and in footers where you have a ton of them just repeated really should be avoided, um, especially if you're doing it for this unnatural purpose of just higher SEO ranking. The link lunch shouldn't look like it was added as an afterthought to boost SEO. It should be a natural part of the content on the page. I also want to point out what I see people do a lot is instead of hyperlinking text the way we did here, so we instead of writing um, first, go to facebook.live.com and check out Facebook's expert tips for shooting Facebook Live and just actually putting their hyperlinked site in there, we instead highlighted the text that was relevant to their um, domain and then hyperlinked in that link. So what people don't a lot of times understand is that anchor text actually affects um, search engine optimization. So just to give you an example further, if somebody had on their website, my friend Sarah is a financial advisor in Chicago who focuses on helping women achieve financial independence. And she hyperlinked helping women achieve financial independence and linked to your site. That would help boost your SEO for those search terms. Women, financial independence, Whereas if somebody has it as more of a branded way where she just has Sarah Wilson financial planning, you, you know, you're not going to be able to avoid that happening. It's going to happen sometimes. And um, there, there's lots of times where it happens where it's not a bad thing. But if you can ever get any editorial control over the way people link back to you. So for instance, you know, we talked about guest posts. If you are a guest poster on a blog and you have any input on how they link to you, you know, ask them, can you hyperlink back to my website with this? Um, because that over time can really help boost your SEO as well, because it's telling the search engine that those keywords are related to your website. So just some link must do's. You want to build up links naturally over time. Don't slap, you know, 500 of them from a link exchange on there at once. Use that relevant hyperlink text from the last slide we just looked at. Understand that it will take time to get links into your website. So even though this is one of you know the biggest things that's going to affect your SEO, it is going to take time. You know you're going to start a new business; it's not going to get 500 links to it naturally. So understand that this is the biggest one of the biggest components of SEO, but it's also one that's going to take the most time. So while you're waiting for it to happen, you just keep producing that great content and sharing it, and you'll be on uh, the right track. So I've listed a couple places where you can actually go and um, add your business. So we start with um, location-based sites and then financial sites and then social sites. These are just starting points and ideas, but these are all places where you can log on, um, create an account, and add your business if it, if it makes sense for you, if you're a location-based business, if you're a fee-only advisor. Um, and then 
you can start having some of those natural links go back to your site, um, you know, while you're waiting to build up some of the other ones that are based on content. So for people who tell me, you know, that they don't want to be on social media, this is also something I try to remind them of is that those social sites also serve as another link back to um, your business that people often forget about. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit talking about off the page factors and talk about something that a lot of people don't necessarily think too much about in terms of the financial advisor space, but it's becoming more and more important, um, especially since Google released RankBrain, which is the current, um, a piece of the current algorithm that they're running. So if you recall from one of the first slides that we looked at, again, local search is an off the page factor. And we're seeing more and more advisors who are telling us that they you know, can work with clients anywhere in the U.S. They're not bound by any one geographic location. But for the most part, I would say, um, even if you're prospecting throughout the country, most advisors, um, their base clientele is still going to make up like 60% or more of their client base, um, or at least how they started. So we know that local search is still important for advisors. And we know that consumers are on their mobile devices now more than ever. So if we take these two factors and combine them, it becomes really, really important. Local search and mobile search. So this image that we're looking at shows how users search for local information throughout the process of buying a product, or in our case as advisors, it would be hiring a new service. So you can see that over 50% of consumers report using their phones when they're first re researching a new service. And so we talked before about how mobile responsive is really important. People are looking to find an advisor, making sure it's somebody that they might want to work with. Um, if your site is not mobile responsive and someone's just doing a generic search you know, for a fi financial advisor and the local results come up, you probably won't be listed. Um, and so you really need to make sure that you do this next thing, which is register your site on Google My Business. Well, first you make sure you get your, a mobile responsive site then make sure that you register your site on Google My Business. So I've included the link here. Um, Google My Business was launched in 2014. I still know, see so many people who, did not, who have not taken the time to register their business. Um, so please, 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 when you leave here, sign up for this and take control of your account. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over that just in the interest of time and just explain a little bit about how this works. So if here we're looking at um, a list of results for a search happening for a financial advisor in Philadelphia. So we can see that the first four search results are all ads, but then again, we get that map. And then that very first result from the map is RTD financial advisors, says headquarters. Um, but then we can also see on the map, this interactive map, there's other advisors that are listed. And it's an interactive map. If you're on your phone, if you're on your desktop, you can click on that and connect to those people. So that is the knowledge graph of local search working. And if we were to keep scrolling down on that page after the RTD, we see that we can actually, from those local search results, um, if we were on a mobile phone, we could click call, we could click directly to their websites or click for directions. So these are prime real estate spots in search engine results, right? You really, really want to be listed, your site to be listed in these because it makes it incredibly easy for someone to get in touch with you and get started getting information. So that Google My Business um, that I mentioned before you need to fill that out if you even want a chance at getting listed in these uh, local search results here. And there are some things that you can do to ensure, or I should not say ensure, but to try and make your Google My Business results stand above everybody else's. And one of those things is to include six or more high-resolution photos. Most people start, stop. Research has shown around four or five. So if you can include, include six or more photos of your business, the outside of your business, the inside, um, having a phone number, hours of operation, um, any, you know, making sure that the information on the map, as we saw that was pulled up, and the address needs to be accurate as well. If you have multiple locations, you should submit all of them to Google My Business and make sure your site explicitly lists where you are located. And you also want to make sure your business address um, is embedded on your website with the Google Map. 
beyond the, the Google My Business, um, as we talked about, you want to build local links. So if you can be featured in your local newspaper, if you can have a column there, or maybe they call and ask you for a, um, a quote, you know, don't brush that off as just some little small local newspaper. Those are the things that can help build those local links back to your site, which will increase your ranking for local search. You can also reach out to people and, you know, suggest um, articles or blog posts that you think would be relevant um, for their readers, the readership. A lot of small local um, papers or news organizations or blogs, you know, they're not going to be getting pitched by um, advisors like yourselves that often. So they might, might be a lot more receptive to it. And again, you want to make sure your NAP data, which is your name, address, and phone is consistent everywhere. So your website, your social media any of those directory listings we went over before, those all need to be the exact same to improve your chance of getting one of those top coveted spots in local search. So we went through a lot of different factors today, and the three most important are links, content, and rank brain. So we, as we saw, the number and quality of links that you have coming back to your site is going to be one of the biggest factors. The content that's actually on your page will tell the search engine which keywords your business is about and what to rank you for. And then, as we said before, RankBrain is the new piece of the algorithm that Google is now using. And why I wanted to bring this up is just that it is really mainly right now being used by Google as a way to interpret searches that people submit to find pages that might not have the exact words that were searched for. So we saw that example before of weather. I didn't write weather outside right now or weather near me. I just used weather. Another example would be if someone searches for a term like Obama, Google understands that they're probably referring to the president of the United States and the results should be relevant to things related to the president of the United States and not just Barack Obama, the person. So Again, this is constantly evolving, um, so just keep it in mind as you're writing your content that your overall content, all of your blog posts, all of your you know, different presence on the web is giving Google a full profile of you and uh, what your site is about. And as RankBrain becomes more prominent, that's going to become really important to keep producing that fresh quality content um, so it can really develop that full persona of you and know what results to show. So I wanted to leave you with an example of an advisor or advisory firm that I really think is doing a great job um, combining the on the page and the off the page SEO. And I think um, Adam from Van Wee Financial is actually on the line today watching. So um, shout out to you, Adam. But if you were to do a search for a financial advisor in Jacksonville Beach, various searches, whether you did a fee only advisor search, if you did a search for um, just advisor in Jacksonville Beach, they're going to rank really high, um, Van Wee Financial is. And you can see here in the results, again, that they're the first of the local searches that um, come up in that um, knowledge graph. So how did they do it? So let's go through all of the things we talked about and what they did. So the first here we see is a picture of their homepage. They started with great content that explains who they are, what they do, and where they do it. They have those headers. Um, that also contain their geographic location and where they're trying to target potential clients. They have also have headers throughout their um, text that summarize the paragraph below it and again include more of those keywords such as independent, fee-only, financial planning, Jacksonville Beach. Um, over here in the page titles we can see words like uh, fiduciary and fair tax. They have an active blog and social media. They post regularly and they follow really all the principles that we outlined earlier using great blog titles, adding images, um, and being active across social media channels and linking back to the website from those channels. So you can see here they even have their um, latest tweets embedded in their website underneath their blog. In terms of the local presence, they not only have a radio show on a local radio station, but um, you know, which would provide links back to their website, but they also are part of the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce, and they write blog posts regularly that link back to the area. So a recent one was titled Jacksonville's Big Pension Problem. So again, it's specific to the people in the community in which they are serving. 
but yet the word Jacksonville is going to help them rank higher in local search. Yet to the people who are coming to their blog, it's not an SEO tactic. It's just great content that's relevant to them. They also have links back and forth to their site that have high domain authority. So they're part of different organizations that are going to have high domain authority for terms like financial planning or certified financial planner or wealth management. They've got them on their website under the affiliations tab. And all of these logos, if you click on them, will take you to any of these websites. So they have those good outbound links that also show the user credibility. But then they also have been um, quoted in national publications like the New York Times and have links to those places where they've been quoted, listed throughout the site. Finally, they make sure to include their contact information with an embedded Google map and that contact information, name, address, and phone number is consistent across all of their pages online, both their website and all of their social media pages. They also took the time to compile a robust uh, Google My Business profile that also includes photos. So I hope this example um, really helps tie everything together for you. I've listed some final thoughts for how you can take what we talked about today and um, you know move forward. So obviously, of course, you want to tackle those on the page aspects before you think about off the page. You don't want to be sending a bunch of people back to your website if you don't first have a good site architecture, site structure, and good URLs. Work with the website developer. Um, shameless plug for 20 over 10 like us or somebody like us who understands basic principles of design and SEO. Blog, blog, blog if you can. The more you can, I promise um, it pays off in the long run if you keep at it and um, you know do it consistently. And really make sure visitors, when they land on your site, they understand who you are and what you do so they don't quickly click off and your search result is no longer relevant in the click-through rate. Don't worry about link exchanges or stuff your page with keywords. And, you know, remember that, S, that you know, providing third-party canned content on your site is not an SEO strategy. The best SEO is great content. So I know that was a long presentation and I'm right up to the end of the hour here, um, but I assume that there will be some questions and I'd be happy to stay on and answer them. Um, I'll keep recording so that they are reflected in the um, recording as well if you need to leave at the top of the hour. So thank you all again for your time. This is my contact information and I also encourage you to um, reach out to me if you have any questions or um, want to talk about any of the points that were covered here today. Okay. So one of the questions that um, came in was, do one-page scrolling site websites hurt your SEO? That's a great question, Desmond. Um, so when he refers to one-page scrolling sites, what he's talking about are the pages where you land on the site and you can scroll through the whole entire site completely without ever needing to click on any subpage. What most SEO experts will agree on is as long as you still code out um, with title tags and appropriate URLs, all of the pages on your site with links so that if someone does click to about, with, instead of scrolling to it, it, the site will just drop them down to that page, you will not, your SEO will not um, suffer. I have seen people come to us where they'll have a domain, you know, like Samantha Financial Planning, and they don't have a single subpage or a single um, URL extension listed anywhere on their site. So the entire site would be Samantha russellplanning.com. They don't have slash about or slash blog with all their posts. Um, that is definitely going to hurt your SEO. So you still need to code out all of those different pages. There used to be an argument that um, people would land on your site, go through all the pages, and then it would register as a bounce rate if they never ended up clicking on anything in one of those visits. But most people are agreeing now that bounce rate in and of itself um, doesn't dictate SEO because somebody could land conceivably you know, on, I'm sure like the New York Times, right? People get links to their articles all the time. They click on them, they read the article and they leave. With the advent of blogging, um, bounce rate is definitely something you want to pay attention to, but it's not in and by itself going to be an SEO factor because the average time on a page is also going to go hand in hand with that. So Google doesn't go into your analytics, Google Analytics, and look at all of these factors. They're more interested in scanning the page. So as long as you have you know, your title tags and your page um, pages separated out with the right proper coding, you'll be fine.
Okay, I'm just looking through some of these other questions. Um, some of them are a little bit specific that I'm going to, I will email and address offline. Um, so I have a question about Yelp. Can an effective Google SEO strategy lead to better Yelp exposure? What is your feedback on financial planning and Yelp? So um, there was a great article, I think it was Michael Kitsis wrote about um, review sites and the whether or not advisors can actually have, you know, recommendations and, and reviews. Um, so I will find that article and, and link to it. But basically, um, as far as my up-to-date understanding goes, and I'm, I'm not a compliance expert, but I believe the latest ruling is that if you make it so that all reviews of your practice are accessible to the person, then you can include them. So if you wanted to have your business listed on Yelp and include a widget with all of your Yelp reviews on your website, you could do that. But the widget would have to come directly from Yelp. Obviously, it'd have to be approved by whoever your compliance department was, which I know a lot of compliance departments would run in the opposite direction super fast. But I believe the actual rules are that you could include it, but it would need to be something that could not be tampered with so that all reviews coming in would be shown both positive and negative without the advisor having any ability to manipulate them. Um, if anybody knows anything more about that, please feel free to share it in the question or chat box and uh, I'll share it with the rest of the attendees. Um, but I will find that article and um, share that in my follow-up email as well. Okay. Um, okay, so somebody's asking, when you say having your street address the exact same, do you mean down to semantics such as street spelled out S-T-R-E-E-T -E -E versus S-T period? Yes. Um, make it easy on the search engine. They are scanning your site, you know, if it's not a real human being sitting there looking at it. So, you know, obviously Google is very smart as an algorithm. They've developed it over time. But everything you can do to make it an exact match the better. I'm not, I didn't get into the really nerdy, super technical stuff today. Um, but there's even things you can do that make it even easier for Google to scan your site running these um, schemas. And that's what that's basically all about is the fact that make it easy on Google to scan things and understand what's affiliated with each other. So uh, yeah, the semantics do do matter. Okay, so we have a couple more minutes. If anyone else has any other questions, please let me know. I'd also love any of your feedback if um, people are interested in a more technical presentation that would include, you know, much more technical SEO factors. I'd love to hear that. Um, we'd be happy to present it. Um, we were, just weren't necessarily sure with how familiar everyone was with some of the basics. Um, so I hope you guys learned something today and can use this to go forward, sign up for Google My Business. Go back and look at your title tags, your blog tags, and uh, make sure you're getting those keywords in your H1s and your H2s.